Welcome to Paradigms at Paradigms.life, the radio show and podcast that brings you inspired, inspiring people with visions of a viable future for life on Earth that includes humans. Hi, I'm Baruch, host of Paradigms. Glad to be here with you. Thanks for listening. I think you're going to find this episode enlightening and moving. A little bit of a trigger warning. We will be talking about animals and helping animals, which also means we'll be talking a bit about animal abuse. Nothing graphic, but I just want you to know that will be discussed. My guest is the executive director of the Network for Animals, a nonprofit organization that works to help animals in need. Right now with the war in Ukraine, there are lots of animals in need, and we'll be talking about that and much more. So let's get right to it now and meet my guest on this episode of Paradigms. David Barrett from the Network for Animals, welcome to Paradigms. Thank you for having me. I'm really glad to talk with you. You're the director of this nonprofit. I'd like to know a bit about the nonprofit, and then I know that you are very busy working on trying to save animals in the war in Ukraine, and I'd like to get into that. But first, tell us a bit about the organization, how it got founded, and where your money comes from, and what you do. Network for Animals is a charity registered in the United States and England and South Africa, and it was founded by perhaps the most pivotal animal welfare figure there has ever been, a man called Brian Davies, who was a poor son of a very, very impoverished family in Wales and grew to be the most influential animal welfare activist there ever was at that time. He was the first person to involve the media in animal welfare issues. And he really did it single-handedly. He was, as I said, he was born poor. He emigrated to Canada when he was 20, joined the Canadian army and was based in New Brunswick. One day a dog was run over in front of his home and he called the SPCA and tried to save the dog and said if they ever needed help, they could call on him which they duly did and gave him a job. Fast forward a a couple of years, and the Canadian government asked him to go to the ice where the Canadian government was subsidizing a massive seal hunt of baby white coat seals. Alone among the observers, Brian said this was so utterly inhumane that it could never be made cruelty free. And he single-handedly took on the Canadian government. But so what he what he actually did was he took a baby seal home and kept it in his bathtub. And he got a lot of letters from people saying, you're doing such a good thing. And he hit on the bright idea of writing back to them and saying, yeah, if you send me some money, I can do even more. And it was the first direct mail campaign for animal welfare there ever was. And it was phenomenally successful. From that single man writing a letter to a few people, he founded the International Fund for Animal Welfare and built it into the biggest animal welfare organization of its kind in the world. Then he had a very successful career at I4. He managed to get the baby white coat seal clubbing banned, and then he retired. But retirement lasted about five seconds for Brian. And he then started Network for Animals maybe 25 years ago now. It focuses mostly on direct aid to domestic animals, uh, dogs and cats. And we pride ourselves on going into the most difficult and dangerous places where animals are most in need. That's our whole modus operandi. We work in deadly places. I am South African. I work a lot in the South African townships. And we've been shot at. We've been mugged. We've had our vehicles shot at. We have gangsters circling us like predators. 
but there's such a tremendous need to help those dogs who get no care, no inoculations, no medical care whatsoever, and they only know abuse. So we go in and we rescue the dogs, we spay them, neuter them, rehome them, and educate the people to try and make lives better for animals. It's been very, very successful. We now have 1.2 million supporters around the world. And we work now, I think, in 26 countries. That's what we do. We see the most horrendous cruelty and we get the most wonderful stories of success. And if I can just give you a success story, because Please. they're so few and far between. One of our biggest challenges in Africa is that donkeys are being wiped out by the voracious Chinese demand for donkey skins. They make the donkey skins into a cosmetic called Ijayo, which women use as a, a face treatment. And there are, I think there are 42 million donkeys in the world. And the Chinese need 2 million donkeys a year to make their cosmetic. So you do the math. It's not going to be long before there are no donkeys left. Right. And they've exhausted the supply in China. So they've hit Africa. Rural African people depend on the donkeys tremendously to bring water from the, the streams, to carry their children to school, to bring firewood. But if somebody comes along and offers them $100, it's a fortune. So they sell their donkeys and they don't really think, OK, who's going to carry the water and the firewood now? The answer to that question is also a very bad answer because it's the women. The, the women become the donkeys. It's absolutely shocking. It's shocking for everybody. Every, it's shocking for the humans. And it's a catastrophe for the donkeys. And we have had some success in combating it. In uh, Zimbabwe, it's been closed down. South Africa is ambivalent, but we're, we're slowly winning. But Tanzania was allowing it. And we got word that a Chinese-run slaughterhouse in one of the remotest regions you can imagine, but not far from the borders with other countries, was killing donkeys in a, a slaughterhouse there in the thousands every day, every day. So we sent in an undercover team and lo and behold, it was they were killing 10,000 donkeys a week. They had a permit to kill 20 donkeys a week. And we managed to persuade the Tanzanian government officials to come and see for themselves what was going on. And as a result of that, we not only got the donkey slaughterhouse closed down, we got the practice of slaughtering donkeys banned in Tanzania completely. So that is a major victory. But you, you know, Barak, we never win. We only win battles because no sooner had everybody left congratulating themselves on a job well done than the Chinese illegally started it again. So as of like three days ago, the police arrested the Chinese people, closed it down permanently and confiscated all the donkeys that were waiting to be slaughtered. So now I've got 868 donkeys that I've got to do something with. And I'm sitting dealing with the Ukraine crisis, but we'll find a way. I know what we're going to do. I just have to find the money to do it. We have to move them from where they are to the other side of the country where there are lots of Maasai pastoralists. Each family can get a donkey. I just have to pay the transport costs, feed the donkeys. <laughs> but it is a victory because there are not, it, we really have made progress there. That's the first part of my conversation with David Barrett, Executive Director of the Network for Animals, a nonprofit that rescues animals in need. We'll be talking more with David about what the organization does, and just about why we love animals. For some music, here's a song by Carl DeKeyer, the Animal Rescue Song. And this is Paradigms at Paradigms.life. Sky 
got super special love sent from heaven up above and it just can't seem to find the right home and in that home someone's hurting now really needs their special power we can help to put them on They just want to help but there's someone's pain Don't want to die in vain Remember the golden rule No kill It's truly real Try to remember No kill mm, No kill special love sent from heaven up above and they just can't seem to find the right home and in their home someone's hurting now really needs their special power we can help to put them on the right trail They just want to help but bear someone's pain Don't want to die in vain Remember
That's one of my favorite artists, Emmylou Harris, with Big Black Dog from her album Hard Bargain. That song inspired me to rescue a dog about 12 years ago. Maybe it'll inspire you. All right, let's get back to my conversation now with David Barrett, Executive Director of the Network for Animals. Animals are part of this world. They are as much a part of this world as we are. In my view, they have as much right to live and thrive in this world as we do. And of course, there are just millions of kinds of animals. We're talking mainly right now, you all work with the domesticated ones. But there's all these animals that are part of this beautiful world that we've been given. And for some people, the animals matter as much as people or in a in a very special way, maybe not the same way. For some people, animals are objects, things to be disposed of. And they don't think of animals as having feelings. Some religions say they don't have a soul. If there is such a thing, who knows? But I guess I want to ask you about the role of animals as part of this world and why it's important that we protect them and value them. Anybody who's had a dog or a cat, can give you the answer to that. They give us such love. Dogs, in particular, absolutely love human beings. What always amazes me when I go into a really horrible situation and I'll find a dog who's been beaten or a dog that's been scalded or a dog that's been whipped, and we rescue this dog which has absolutely no reason to be anything except frightened. And they'll come to me and they'll lick my hand. A a human, my friend, I'm saved. They really do behave like that. Cats and anybody who says that cats are aloof. Yes, cats are aloof, but they can be wonderfully loving. It's a sad story, but... To me, it exemplifies it. I had a wonderful cat that I rescued from abuse on a Greek island. And I adopted Houdini because that poor cat had nine lives to survive as long as he did from the abuse. And he lived with uh, me for about 10 or 12 years. And I travel all the time. Fortunately, my wife is there to look after him. So he always had a really good home. But my wife was away and I was away. And when I got back from a long overseas trip, Houdini ran up to me, gave me the most affectionate welcome, and then died lying on my bed. He'd waited until, I can't even think about it without getting tearful. Oh, not not good for your audience. I'm right with you. I'm tearing up too. My beautiful dog friend, Zach, died about four months ago, and he'd been with me for 10 years, and he was a rescue, and he was just, I love dogs and cats. This was an extraordinary creature. This was a bodhisattva. I'm absolutely convinced he was a soul committed to helping on this earth, and after he was with me, he's gone off to do other great things. But what an amazing experience to know someone. And and I really, I don't say my dog, my cat. I say my dog friend, because he was his own person. You know, yeah, you know, just like Houdini. And, you know, that makes it all the more terrible what people do to animals. And you mentioned that people treat them as if they don't have feelings. And in many parts of the world, that's exactly how people treat them. They are simply tools, inanimate tools to be used, abused and discarded. The horror stories are endless, but we we focus on rescuing those animals. I think the numbers change every day, but I think at the moment we're we're feeding something in the order of 4,700 dogs a month. Every month we feed roughly 4,700 dogs, street dogs around the world. These are dogs that live in shelters, and often those shelters are impoverished, staffed by a few volunteers who love animals but have no money, or they're literally street dogs who live on the streets. I always think that what we're doing is such a good thing because without us, there would be so much more suffering. I have a friend who lives on the island of Crete, and she 
speaking of Greek cats, she feeds, I don't know, dozens of cats, but she also, and I don't know if she's done it yet, we've fallen out of uh, touch, but was going to bring a vet to the island and just do a mass neutering of cats just to see if she could get the population down a bit because there's literally just thousands of feral cats on this island that they have a tradition actually you know of the wild cats but now there's so many that of course it means scarcity of food disease and yes more suffering so if the goal is to alleviate suffering it sounds like network for animals is on the job we work with cats in greece we work with dogs and cats in greece but we work with cats on the Greek islands because in summer they have a paradise life. The tourists feed them, the restaurants are open and the restauranteurs feed them. Then winter comes. All the tourists go, the restaurants close down and the cats are left for themselves. And because there are low standards of spaying and neutering, they breed like crazy. The saddest thing of all is that then in a, in a primitive form of population control, the local people poison them. So we've just, just, just two weeks ago, I think, we just finished a big program in the tourist village of Fiscado in the island called Kefalonia, a very beautiful, beautiful place. This is a, an isolated area. Uh, it's difficult to get to. Mostly it's yachtsmen that come in and they spend a, a night in the harbour and then float away again. But there are lots of cats. And uh, we decided we were going to try to spay and neuter all of them, all of the street cats. And we estimate there are probably 400 in the area. And then the local people won't poison them because they will realise the problem is solved. Well, we managed 247 in a week. Wow. And then uh, we, we sort of run out of money. <laughs> we kind of run out of money. It's a terrible thing to say. So but we're going back. I'll raise some more money and we'll go back and we'll finish the job. So we do our very best and we do make a big difference. Greek cats have great personalities. That's my take on it. If you're an animal lover, I'm sure the things David is talking about matter to you. If you're not someone who's ever really connected with animals, this might be an opportunity to think about that and consider trying it out. Maybe go down to an animal shelter and meet some dogs and cats. Or if you have friends that have pets, maybe go spend a little time with their animal friends. All right, we'll be back with more of my conversation with David Barrett. But, of course, it is time for some more music. Here's an artist. We're going to hear a few songs from this artist in this episode. This is the first one. It's called The Cat Song, Laura Nero, from her album Smile. Thank you. 
That's the Joe Cuba Sextet with Donkey Serenade. Before that, we heard the Cat Song by Laura Nero from her album Smile. We'd love to know your thoughts about what you're hearing. Please make a comment. Maybe share something about your experiences with animal friends in your life. Have you ever rescued a dog or a cat or another animal? We'd love to hear about that. Also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. and We'll let you know about all the new videos as they are released. All right, let's get back to my conversation with David Barrett, Executive Director of the Network for Animals. You're listening to Paradigms at Paradigms.life. I was in Jaffa in Tel Aviv and was told about the cats there because I saw lots of cats that had a notch on their ear. And I was told that when they, they scoop them up and they neuter them and then they put a notch on their ear to mark them so they people know it's been done. Maybe that's you all. Oh, we work in Israel. I have the absolute utmost respect for our partner in Israel. It's starting over sanctuary. They do a phenomenal job with dogs in that area and also with donkeys because in the Bedouin areas, they are often hideously abused and often, sad to say, by children. We had a a case recently where there was a baby donkey that for some reason had been abandoned. We don't know why. And when we were alerted, children were beating the donkey to death. It's a very difficult thing to talk about because this happens in very specific areas and politics immediately becomes a problem. To the enormous credit of the Israelis, they don't try to make political capital out of what is a very terrible problem. They simply rescue the animals. So we work with them and we are very proud to work with them. And we are funding them to them as much as we can, but the need is great. The need is great. Israel is one of our stars for what they do, the work that they do. We're very proud to be working with them. Let's talk about what's going on in Ukraine and how it's impacting animals. Barak, I've worked in animal welfare for 35 years. I have never experienced anything like this. It is a a catastrophe. It's a catastrophe because the people have to flee their homes, often taking a suitcase if they're lucky or they are not allowed to take their animals or they simply can't. Poland doesn't want them to take animals in. The veterinary authorities there have just banned horses, which is giving me a nightmare because I don't know how I'm going to get horses out. I'm working on the Romanian border now. Maybe we can get some across on the Romanian border. But it's the dogs and cats that are really, really suffering because these are pets. And they're in every town that's been attacked by the Russians. It's too dangerous to work in those areas. We can only get as close as we can. So we have based ourselves on the Polish border with the Ukraine, and we've bought an animal ambulance, that, and we're sending it in 24 hours a day, taking in dog food and bringing back as many animals as we can. And that's a tip of the iceberg. But the good news is that we're working informally with all sorts of groups, locally and internationally. And we've come together in this area on the border and we're sharing resources and we're sharing uh, deliveries to get the food into the areas. But it's very, very dangerous. There's been numerous animal rescuers killed already, bombed, shot. One of the saddest things is that in many of these towns, when the people fled, They didn't realize that they were going to have to be away for a long time. They thought they'd flee the bombing and then come back. So they left their pets locked up in their apartments. Yeah. And then they couldn't get back. So we've got volunteers and they are the bravest of people. We've got volunteers. And when there's a lull in the fighting, they go into these apartment areas and they literally go from door to door seeing if there's an animal locked inside and they break down the door or they smash a window and they get the animals out. But 
it is terribly dangerous. And of course, time is running out for the animals because now days have gone by and they're going to starve to death. I don't even have words. It's just for anyone who loves animals. I mean, these are, as you say, all they do is give us love and depend on us. And for our human madness to impact these really completely beautiful creatures, loving, innocent creatures, it's beyond immoral. Let me tell you a story about what happened yesterday. It's very dangerous when these people go out to rescue animals. And so we kind of wait anxiously. Will When are they coming back? Will they come back? A truck that we'd sent in came back loaded with animals. And among them was a mom and her 10 puppies in cage. She was absolutely frozen with fear, terrified, shaking and quivering. And we coaxed her out of her cage and carried her into the shelter and placed the puppies in the kennel with her. And she stood staring at the wall, unable to move, but she let her puppies suckle. And she's going to be fine. She's going to be fine. We'll be back with the final part of my conversation with David Barrett after we hear some more music. We're going to start out with another Laura Nero song. Laura Nero was a big animal lover. This one's called Animal Grace from her album Angel in the Dark.
1914 This ball was at war It went from Belgium on through Ireland The Congo then back home This big blue ball of war Spun on its own Spinning history in lines of blood When many souls Nancy Griffith, who we lost recently, great artist, wonderful human being, with the song Big Blue Ball of War. Before that, we heard from Yoko Ono, Ask the Elephant. We started that set out with Laura Nero's song Animal Grace. Now here's the final part of my conversation with David Barrett, Executive Director of the Network for Animals. We talk about post-traumatic stress with humans. Animals are as susceptible to the, the terror of this, all the stress and what it does to them is just, I mean, as you say, they can come back and be loving even after being abused, but animals feel trauma too. If I was a dictator, <laughs> which my <laughs> office sometimes say I am, <laughs> I wouldn't say every family should have a dog and a cat from, from early to get to know them once i think it's the jesuits who say give me a child before he's six and he's mine for life mm. uh, in the catholic faith well if you learn to love animals when you're a child you will always love animals 
there are cultural differences about how people relate with animals, about what animals are food. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that we haven't touched on, you know, that informs how people treat animals. Sometimes, it, you know, what, what we in the U.S. think is terrible in another country, they might think that's growing food. You know, there are places where they eat dogs. I don't eat dogs, but I eat other animals. So how we justify these things to ourselves is always a mystery. But the reality is we share this earth with these other creatures. We've talked a lot about our domestic animals, but we have another animal charity called Animal Survival International, which focuses on wild animals, particularly in Africa. And elephants are my great love. Dogs, cats, squirrels. We have squirrels in our garden. so. <laughs> <laughs> but elephants are my great love. And they are so intelligent, so loving. They can be very dangerous. Let's, let's not pretend otherwise. An elephant charging at you is something you never want to see and could very easily be the last thing you'll ever see. But they are such loving, intelligent creatures. They have such clearly defined social structures and their habitat is being destroyed. And ivory poachers are wreaking absolute havoc with the populations. If you could just once be in the Africa and watch an elephant herd just for a few hours as it walks through the bush and see how the interaction, you would know that we are privileged to share earth with elephants. They are in many ways better than us. And I love them. I just love elephants. There are so many amazing, beautiful creatures that we have pretended they are objects and don't have intelligence, but okay, elephants, dolphins, they're clearly smarter than we are, you know. <laughs> and, and, and not that intelligence is the great measure. I love bears. I'm from Vermont. There are bears in Vermont. I love them. They're just beautiful to watch. There was a, I, I, where I lived, there were a bunch of old apple trees. I remember one day Mama Bear had come and she had three cubs, which is pretty unusual because it had been a good food year. And there's three cubs eating apples out of the apple tree. And I got to watch. I mean, when one encounters animals in the wild, I think everyone feels a sense of wonder and amazement. Now, for some people, they just want to hunt them and they want to put their head on the wall. And I'm, I'm not someone who is down with that. I do understand people hunting for food. But these are, like you said, you know, we're privileged to share Earth with these creatures. I can never understand people who want to shoot an animal for a trophy. And yet it's a major problem in Africa. And it's dressed up. The, the professional hunting outfits that run these tours dress it up and sell it to the hunters as being good for the conservation of the species because the money that the hunters will pay for shooting an elephant will go to help the environment, help local communities. It's completely untrue. Research has definitively shown that all that happens is that the hunters hunt in one area until all the game's gone or all the interesting game's gone and move on, leaving nothing behind but broken promises. There's a big drought in Kenya right now, and I just had a team there, and we're building brand new water holes for elephant herds up in the northwest of the country. That will give them hope until the rains fall. So we've saved a bunch of elephants and giraffes and pretty much everything up there. Are there any films or videos put out by Network for Animals that people can look at? Because I think people relate visually. Yes, we, we regularly post short videos. Making videos is a very expensive business. So, and our money goes to the animals. But we try to do video updates of our work. And there's a lot on Facebook. If any of your listeners want to see one, they just have to type in Network for Animals on Facebook and a lot will come up. We're sometimes lucky and people donate their services and we get a really professional looking video and that's really good. And uh, it's interesting that we're getting an enormous amount of people following our work 
in Ukraine on Facebook, which is very good because it's great that we help animals and we must do as much as we can. But we can't save every animal in the world. But if we can raise awareness, if we can tell people why it's cruel, if we can tell them that animals love us and they're good for us, then that's something that will last long into the future. Network for Animals, and the other one is? Animal Survival International. Animal Survival International. David Barrett, the work you're doing is so important. I'm, I'm going to make a donation. I, I'm really thrilled to talk with you, and I'm, I'm so glad you're doing what you're doing. Well, Barak, it's lovely to talk to you. And um, I must say, you seem like a really wonderfully empathetic person. So thank you for listening. On behalf of all the animals, thank you. David Barrett, thank you so much for being on the show and talking with me about Network for Animals, about the work you all do, and the great need for support in helping animals right now. Animals in Ukraine are in dire straits, and in many places in the world where animals are either abused or are simply neglected. David, I think the work your organizations are doing is really great. So thank you so much for sharing with us. Folks, if you'd like to learn more about Network for Animals, their website is networkforanimals.org. Check them out. There's a lot of good stuff on their website. Their Facebook page has a bunch of videos. And they have a YouTube channel with over 300 videos. So check that out. If you enjoyed this episode of Paradigms, I hope you'll also check out our archives at the Paradigms website, paradigms.life and in iTunes, and wherever else you find your podcasts. Paradigms has also just launched a YouTube channel, Paradigms Podcast. Check it out. A very talented friend of mine named Leah Zylona is making videos of the Paradigms episodes. So we're putting up each week's new episode and then at least one from the archives a week. So we're, we're gradually building up our presence on YouTube. I think you'll enjoy the videos Leah is really fun and talented. Paradigms has a Patreon campaign going at patreon.com slash paradigms. I hope you'll visit that too. Become a supporter. We really appreciate our Patreon supporters. All right, we're wrapping up the episode. I'm going to leave you with one more track of music, another Laura Nero song. This one is called Like a Flame, the Animal Rights Song. And let's have the word for the week be compassion. Let's especially extend our compassion to our animal friends, those we share the planet with. And let's be honest, we make their lives hard. Humans make it difficult for animals. Let's see if we can make it better for them. All right, compassion is the word. Baruch signing off for Paradigms. We'll be back next time with more inspired, inspiring people. Until then, be well. Prejudice for the color of his skin. Prejudice.
prejudice for a woman, prejudice for an animal, like the elephant of the play. Behind a tree Prejudice for an animal Like the elephant Of the play been listening to Paradigms at paradigms.life.